Seven years ago, Turkey was plunged into a night of chaos after a rogue element within the Turkish armed forces tried to overthrow the country's elected government. As state buildings were hit from the sky and tanks rolled through the streets, Turkish citizens rose up to take their country back. When it was over, at least 251 people had lost their lives, while more than 2,000 were injured. The failed coup began on the evening of July 15th after rock soldiers took over the streets of Istanbul. Simultaneously, fighter jets attacked the parliament in the capital. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who was on holiday at that time, appealed to the nation through a video call on live TV. In a few hours, rebel soldiers were overpowered by ordinary citizens. After the coup was firmly put down, all evidence pointed to Fethullah Gülen as the mastermind. A nationwide crackdown would follow and expand globally as Turkey moved to dismantle Gülen's FETA network across Asia, Africa and Europe. And to further discuss how the country has changed since the failed coup, joining me now from Istanbul is Mehmet Çelik. He is the editorial coordinator at Daily Sabah and from Washington, D.C., Rich Outsen. He is a former U.S. diplomat. A warm welcome to you both and thanks for joining me on Straight Talk. So, Mehmet, seven years on since the coup attempt, how much has changed in Turkey? Well, indeed, a lot has changed. I mean... In a way, in the initial years after the the, the, the the failed coup attempt, we can say that the state has gone through a, a detox, a cleanse, to to eliminate the infiltrations uh, of the the Gulenist terror group members. However, has the state or all the institutions have been fully cleared? This is something that I think we can. The state is still going through some processes to target. Uh, some of the some of the the network parts that are still remaining active, um, uh, that are still uh, posing a threat to the state institutions, mm -hmm. and this is a, this has been taking a long time, particularly because this uh, this network is not one that can be easily identified or targeted very easily, uh, uh, as they have been uh, very very successful in hiding themselves or. Or uh, uh, you know, covering their shady uh, uh, sh or shadowy network. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a network that all its members are very uh, visible or very easily identifiable, as they have been, uh, you know, d uh, covering themselves through different identities. Different, uh, uh, they have been portraying themselves uh, through different uh, uh, forms of uh, uh, networks through their uh, multi-layer network system that it's not very easy to pinpoint yes. who is part of this network. But still, we can say that the state has been taking a huge step uh, uh, since then, and uh, mainly has been clear, cleared of this uh, uh, shadowy network. But political system has also changed in Tur Turkey. Uh, as we know, it has shifted from parliamentary system yes. to a presidential system as well. So, um, Rich, Turkey's relations with the West has seen ups and downs uh, since the coup attempt. Are they likely to take a more stable trajectory after the NATO summit, uh, when President Erdogan especially has agreed to Sweden's accession into NATO? Yeah, thanks, Aisha. It's good to be here with you. I think uh, it's definitely headed on a better trajectory, and I think the fundamentals of the relationship uh, are still such that we can expect further improvement and uh, further convergence. When we think about the last 10 years and what's happened in the bilateral relationship, we had several major blows to what had been a traditionally strong relationship. And part of that has to do with the attempted coup seeing the anniversary of today, uh, or tomorrow actually in Washington time. It is very difficult for Americans to understand the backdrop to that attempted coup, the long attempts mm -hmm. to infiltrate uh, the military bureaucracy and parts of the civilian justice system, the break that led to uh, the Gulen organization trying to orchestrate this forcible takeover of power, and just how traumatic that was for the Turkish people to see people dying in the streets and with the whole history of, of coups that the country has. Americans were very insulated from that, and very few of them know the backstory. So that was a big blow. And that came on top of the Syria debacle, in which after both being lined up against Assad to start with, we had this dramatic divergence in paths between the United States and Turkey uh, with regards to how to deal with the problem of ISIS or Daesh and how to deal with the uh, refugees and all that. So between the Syria war and the attempted coup in Turkey, we, uh, Turkey, we came to this incredibly bad space in bilateral relations. 
the most recent issues over F-35, F-16, S-400 were layered on top of that. But now, as Turkey gets better, goes through this cleansing process uh, that, that was just discussed, I think that there's more balance in the relationship. And we've resumed forward movement on some things like NATO expansion and opposing Russian aggression against NATO that, that bode for good improvement mm -hmm. and good dynamics in the relationship. I think especially if the F-16 deal uh, comes to pass, which we're, we're looking closer and closer on, we're going to have an important joint project for us to pin as the sort of the emblem of a new and better period. So, uh, Mehmet, you talked about the transition Turkey had gone through uh, in these seven years. How are Turkey's efforts to bring the perpetrators of the failed coup to justice going so far? I mean, is it getting enough support from Western partners? Because we just mentioned the U.S. stance, how it, in a way, kind of failed to understand Turkey's concerns. But how about uh, Turkey's European partners? Well, I think, you know, if we look at the presence of uh, this networks or this terrorist groups members, how they have been easily uh, active and they've been free to 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 you know propagate against Turkey within European uh, countries' borders and also the United States. The the we can we can draw a better picture on the cooperation between Turkey and its European or or, or Western allies in general on how they have been supporting Turkey's fight against this terrorist group. Um, I, I, I can't say that this has been a very, very smooth one and a successful one um, in the bilateral ties between Turkey and, and, and the EU or Turkey uh, uh, and the United States. Unfortunately, they haven't been supporting Turkey when it comes to fight against FETO. Mm -hmm. um, as it, they, they haven't listed the terrorist group as a terrorist organization. The FETO um, terrorist group's leader resides, and its prominent members, they reside in the United States and European capitals. So the rhetoric has been there to, to, to say that Turkey will be supported in its fight against terrorism. But in addition to FETO, I think even when it comes to Turkey's fight against the YPG, which is the PKK's Syria affiliate, um, the Western support to political support and military support has been present when it comes to uh, the YPG. And it's uh, you know turning a blind eye or ignoring their uh, the, the FETO's presence within their borders has been also a, a, a roadblock in Turkey's uh, bilateral ties with the West in, in, when when there is efforts to repair or re restart uh, this uh, this uh, um, ties on a better goodwill actually. So the Western part hasn't been successful. Unfortunately, Turkey hasn't been getting support that it needs and it requires. And it should be getting. Mm -hmm. However, within Turkey, I think these, the processes and trials have been very, very uh, good within the rule of law. And there's a very good functioning justice system in Turkey that these have been, they, they're, brought, they're being brought to, to justice yes. and put on trials. So, um, Rich, as a former diplomat, why is Turkey experiencing difficulties in convincing its partners of the risks uh, posed by both FETO terror organizations and the PKK by PD terror organizations to its national security? What's lacking here? Well, I think it's two very different cases. Uh, I think, broadly speaking, uh, Turkey is winning its case in the court of public opinion with regards to PKK. I think as more information uh, comes out it, it, about the activities of the PKK, for instance, in Sweden and in Germany and in other countries with fundraising, propaganda, recruitment, it becomes less and less tolerable for people to talk about uh, turning a blind eye to PKK. They still have this carve out for YPG, but I think that's eroding as well. Uh, and that has to do with the role YPG had in fighting ISIS. Now, FETO is an entirely different thing. You have to remember that uh, the Gulen organization, and to be honest, we, with the ex officio support from the Turkish government for about a decade, was the primary face of Turkey in Washington, D.C. So you had the Gulen organization that was essentially putting on yes. festivities, was sponsoring trips for U.S. congressmen to go to Turkey and to go to other countries in which they were operating schools. So for a decade or 15 years, Washington came to know Gulen and his organization as part of the Turkish system, right? Yes. And, and as sort of good guys. They were, they were the nice face of Turkey. Now, what they didn't see was the underside of that, where that same organization 
was trying to infiltrate the intelligence and police, the judiciary, the military, and ultimately to try to seize power in Turkey. So to get rid of that first impression is going to take a long, long time. Yeah. And I think uh, what you still have in Washington is a general sympathy for that group and a refusal to see them as the same as PKK or yeah. as a terror organization rather than political opposition. Unfortunately. All right, gentlemen, we're out of time. Thank you very much for joining me on Straight Talk.